So, we're in Lesson 31. It is Chapter 36. Uh, as we ended up the last chapter, Moses had seen fit, uh, when he was writing this book, to sum up the life of Isaac at the end of the last chapter. And if you remember, he said, and Isaac was 180 years old, and he died, and Jacob and Esau buried him in the tomb there where Abraham was. And uh, then we go on like Isaac has died, but Isaac has not died yet. The reason why we know that Isaac has not died yet is because we know the age of Jacob, and we know the age of Isaac, and we know the age of Joseph. And so Joseph, um, Joseph has to go into Egypt for 13 years before Isaac dies. But what Moses is doing is he is summing up the rest of the information of, about Isaac, so we don't have to deal with Isaac any longer. In this chapter, chapter 35, uh, chapter 36, I'm sorry, Moses is doing the exact same thing. He's summing up the life of Esau to tell us all the information that he knows about Esau, because when this chapter is over, we're going to swing back in time a little bit, to Joseph being 17 years old, and he's going to be sold into captivity. Uh, he's going to be sold to two of his Two different strains of cousins. You got that? Two different lines of cousins are going to join together, two different groups, to buy Joseph from his brothers, and then they're going to sell him to the bodyguard of the Pharaoh down in Egypt a few days later. Well, uh, Esau, uh, Moses is going to sum up the entire life of, of Esau so that he never has to speak about Esau again. Why? Because Moses is writing the book of Genesis and then the book of Exodus. So some of the information that he's putting here in this chapter, we have to know for the book of Exodus to make makes sense. When they're going to take the promised land, we have to know about this information. Not only in the book of Exodus, but, but the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy. We have to know this information because we're going to look at these names and we'll go back. By the way, for those of y'all who have enjoyed the book of Job in your life, you're going to see the names of the friends of Job come up in this lesson also. So this lesson is important just primarily to Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the book of Job, just a few. But there's also information that is spattered throughout the rest of the Bible that comes from this chapter, so we will know. But I want you to understand something. Moses is 400 years, and writing this 400 plus years after the life of Esau. And so he is writing it as if, as if he knows the lineage. He does because he does know the lineage because it's been passed down to him. But what Moses does in this chapter is he begins at the beginning of Esau, or actually uh, Esau's children and the, his wives, and he ends with the descendants of Esau who are in power in the land of Edom at the time that Moses is writing the book. So the message in chapter 36 goes from about 2259, 2259 years after the creation of Adam until they've already come out of Egypt two years later, 432 years is what it is. So we've got this problem going on here that we have to deal with. Well, it picks up and says, now these are the records of the generation of Esau. Now you see some well-meaning editor has said in here, that is Edom. They put it in, we put it in parentheses because our, our translators are saying, we know from the, uh, from the autographs, from the originals, actually from the copies of the originals that we have, that that doesn't belong there. But somewhere along the line, some well-meaning editor uh, added that is Edom. Now that is actually going to come up later on in verse 8. There it belongs, so that we're going to get the same information. But someone came along at the first of this chapter and tried to help us out. Verse 2 says this, Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Adah, the daughter of Elion, the Hittite, and Oliabama, 
no relation to the president. Past president. And only Obama, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zebian, the Hit, uh, Hivite, also based math, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Naboth, and Ada bore Eliphaz to Esau, and Basemath bore Ruel, and only Obama bore Jeush, Jam Jamla, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Whew, boy, hmm, glad I'm past that. Except we got a whole chapter left of this type of stuff. So just hang on, okay? I'm going to try to make it as easy and as simple as you can. I made a mistake on the chart. I'm going to correct your chart. In that chart, you see it starts with Judith, daughter of Barry, in red. Off to the side of that ought to be another one. I knew it. I just didn't put it. I think I got sidetracked when I was making the chart because I know this. We also need to put base math, the dollar of Elon, there too. So my, you want to correct that chart. So it should say base math, the daughter of Elon, Judith, the daughter of Barry, Ada, the daughter, daughter of Elon, same Elon, by the way, Base math, the daughter of Ishmael, got that? All right, different, different base math, and Ole Obama, the daughter of Zebian. In fact, there actually may be another wife too that is a daughter out there, and we'll see that in just a minute. But we're not sure if that other daughter is the same daughter as this one right here, but we'll see that in just a, a few minutes. And so, as we look at the chart that is here, we'll see that these, these wives of Esau bore children. Esau had five sons that we know of. Had he had more, I believe Moses would have put them in here. He had Eliphaz, he had Raul, he had Jeus, Jalam, and Korah. Just those are the five sons. That's what that passage says to us. We've got a problem right off the bat, and I've already told you what that problem is by the adding of these two names. In Genesis chapter 26, it's on the bottom of page 253 on your notes, it says, it says this, And when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Okay. So Esau has named the wives up above in 36, but back in 26, he told us two wives that are not listed there. What happened to those wives? Where are they? We don't know. Maybe they have died by the time that Moses is writing this, and that's a good possible answer to that question. We don't know the answer to that, so let's don't read anything into it, and let's don't read anything out of it. Uh, let's just take it as it is that there were two other wives that we know of, but we don't know what has happened to them. Now you say, could there be two base maths? Well, absolutely. Whenever my daughter was born 20 years ago, uh, we knew of one Madison in this world, and that was my Madison. And within two years, there was a whole gross of Madisons. Uh, 144 at least, a gross, okay, whole bunch. And I know that because we can go to our database here at the church, as big a church as we are, and we can put in uh, 1996, 1997, 1998, and pull up all the Madisons, and there's more than a gross of them, okay, because that name became very popular. What's the most popular name this year? Anybody know? For a girl. Anybody know? What's the po Huh? No, it's actually Olivia is this year's popular. It is Olivia. I mean, you're turning around and Olivia. And the other name is, huh? Ashlyn is exactly right. Is right. You just hear these names. We just, these, these names come, you know. We don't hear many people being named Ned anymore, okay? It's just not one of those common names that you okay and we go through the jimmy stage and the james stage and you know and, and you're not hearing many franklins out there because we're just not grabbing actually we are getting some franklins that's the middle name that type of stuff all right so names come and go humans have not changed since that we were created 
people of like kind, like names, and they pick those names for their kids. And so we see these names going through. Okay, so now on the next page of your notes, chapter 28 says here, it's an interesting thing. It says, and Esau went to Ishmael and married besides the wives that he had. In other words, he's got other wives. Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Naaboth. Okay, now we got a problem here. I personally believe that this is a Canaanite name for the Hebrew name of this girl right here. I believe that's the Canaanite name of this Ishmael, of this uh, Hebrew name right here. I believe that is the exact same person. I may be wrong. That's just my opinion. So as we look here, uh, Ishmael, uh, Esau has been collecting wives a whole lot longer than, than Jacob collected wives. Uh, Jacob got all of his in just, you know, one week's time, basically. I mean, he had to work a week, and then he got one, and then he got another one the next week, and then he got the maids that came along. Boom, he's got them, okay? Uh, Esau, on the other hand, has been marrying. We do not know whether Esau had any children prior to him being 71 years of age, when Jacob was 71 years of age, when Jacob got sent away from home. He was sonless, because remember, in most cases, Moses only listed the names of the sons. Now, Esau could have had some girls, but they were not listed. Now, we've only got a few girls who are going to be mentioned, because they're important to the lineage Moses did not list all the girls. He didn't. And so here Esau has got other wives and he goes and he marries and marries this other gal. I think that gal is this gal right here is what we're talking about. So in this length of time, um, Esau could have had girls, but we know he hadn't had any boys. He doesn't start having boys until Jacob has left and gone to Haram. Picking up verse 6. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and the livestock and all his cattle and all his goods which he had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For their property had become too great for them to live together and the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of their livestock. Let's read between the lines. Let's don't put anything there that shouldn't be there, but let's don't leave anything out. Remember, Jacob is wealthy. And just from what we know about Esau, Esau was probably equally as wealthy. And don't forget Daddy Isaac. Isaac inherited everything of his wealthy father, Abraham. So we have three wealthy uh, men who are related, father and two sons, and when we talk about wealth, we're in this in this time we're talking about livestock. Now I've already told you this. I don't know much about land around here, but I do know about land uh, up up in Waco area. Now outside of Waco, there's an 800 acre ranch, uh, which was my wife's father, and. Uh, Six out of seven years, uh, the most cattle he could run on that 800 acres successfully was about 100 head of cows. Yes, they're going to have their calves, but of course, as the calves come along, they're going to be sold and traded and, you know, that type of stuff. So he had to keep about 100 head full-grown mature cows. He, the land could sustain that. About one out of every seven years, it would be a great year. It would just be a wonderful year. He could probably keep 200 to 250, but that's not the norm. One, the norm. When that happened, he was cutting hay and selling it, in other words. He was trying to get rid of the, of the hay so it wasn't wasted and making money off of it. So the same thing is, 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 is true uh, here. Uh, I don't know what the land was like there because it's different, different places. Uh, uh, but what we know is that the land where Jacob, Esau, and Isaac are living, which is in Haran, which is by the Oaks of Mamre, which is where the cave is that Abraham is buried and, and Sarah is buried and, and um, uh, uh, Isaac is going to be buried. They're back in that area and those three families have grown so large 
that they can't live together any longer. We saw this with Abraham and Lot. Remember that? Their families became so large, both of them became so wealthy, that they had to split up and go a little further. Well, here's the deal. Esau had already lived down in the mountains of Seir. When Jacob returned from Haran uh, in 2242, uh, Esau had come up from the mountains of Seir. Uh, that's the mountains of the Hor where the Horites are living. Who, the Horites are actually Hittites. And the group that live in the mountains, that live in the caves, are called uh, Horites. And here we go. Canaan was a grandson of Noah, had a son by the name of Heth. And all the descendants of Heth, including Seir, which is who we're fixing to talk about, were called Hittites. But of those Hittite groups, the ones that lived out on the borders of, by the Mediterranean Sea were called Hittites. But those who moved inside, in, inland from the sea, between the sea and the sand of the, uh, what we would call Iraq sand now, they were called Midlanders. But the, the group that went down to the caves down in the mountains, they were called Horites. They're all the same family. They're all the same group. These are just different branches because of where they live. That's how those names worked there. And so what has happened is uh, uh, Moses is telling us that Esau, uh, Esau uh, was living down there in Seir. And he went up to meet Jacob as he was coming in. And Jacob offered him 550 head of cow, uh, livestock, if you remember. And he gave him as a gift. And they sent him back home. And then he, Jacob went west instead of going south, as he promised. And finally, it took about 10 years or so for Jacob to land back down with his dad, Isaac. And during that time, Esau evidently had come over to live with them too. So they're all living together as a family. But now their, their wealth has gotten so large that the land cannot sustain it. So Esau has moved away. With that, we go to verse 8. It says, so Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Now remember, Seir is the son of Heth. He's a Hittite. But because he's living in the caves, he's called a Horite because that means cave dweller. And so that's how those names. And you're going to see sometimes those names are flipped and they'll say Hittite. Sometimes they'll say Hivite. Sometimes they'll say Horite. And it's the same name and it's the same person because it's all the same time and it, it all has to do with the same, um, the same clan. Here we see that it says Esau is Edom. Now, Esau and Edom are the same person. Esau and Edom are the same person. In our English translations, we do something so that we know who we're talking about. Let me just give you a broader example. In all, all of our Old Testament prophets in Hebrew, the name that we call them, Jeremiah, Jonah, Michael, Ezekiel, Amos, okay. All of those names in Hebrew are actually the names of something else. But we put a specific name on them so that we will know whom we're talking about. I'll give you an example. There is an Old Testament prophecy book in our Bible that the name when you read it in Hebrew, is dove, a dove. Got it? The prophet's name is dove. It just so happens uh, in the miracle of how our Old Testament's put together, you can go back to every place that name is used and pick out the scenario that is being spoken about that name, be it Amos, be it Obadiah, be it the dove, be it Jonah, whatever. And it tells the story of that prophet. You got that? So this, we've got this book out there that the name actually in Hebrew is dove. Let me tell you the story. When you go back and you pick up, there happens to be seven scriptures that have the word dove in them in, in our Old Testament. One is that the dove is sent on its way, but it does not go where it's supposed to go. That's one of the situations. Next situation is the dove is captured and returned to the place that it should have gone in the first place. Does anybody know the, the prophet by now? 
Jonah. That is correct, okay? And actually, there's seven characteristics of the dove. That's the only place the dove is used in Scripture seven times, and it describes the ministry of Jonah. You can do that for Amos. You can do that for Malachi. You can do that for Obadiah, just Habakkuk. Their names have meanings. That's what's so interesting about how the Scripture proves itself. And so you will never see a prophet's name that is not defined for his ministry, is not defined for him in the Scripture. Okay, let's go back to Esau and Edom. Jacob probably did not call uh, Esau Esau. He called Esau Edom because when Esau came down, he was named Red. Hey, Red. Got it? He was red, he was burly, he was hairy, whatever you want to call it, he was red. Red hair, the whole nine yards. That name is Edom. So what our English translators have done, so we always know who we're talking about. We always know who we're talking about. Is we, when we're talking about Esau, Jacob's twin brother, we call him Esau in English. When we're talking about Esau's descendants, his family, we use the name Edom, which was actually his name. And when we're talking about the land that he lived in, we call it Edom. It's the land of the Edomites. You got that? We call it Edom. And so on maps, you see that. So Esau, Edom, same name for the same person. But we call him Esau when we're talking about the man. We call him Edom when we're talking about the people. Verse 9. These are the records of the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's son, Eliphaz, the son of his wife, Adah. Well, the son of his wife, Basemith. So what happened to the other wife? Don't know why he summed that up. But he's going to do it in just a moment. Verse, uh, chapter 36, verse 11, talks about the sons of Eliphaz. Now we're going to break this down. And the sons of Eliphaz was Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gotham, Kenaz, and Timnah, his concubine of Esau's son, Eliphaz. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. And these are the sons of Esau's wife, Adah. Hmm. Well, in other words, the sons of his wife plus one son of his concubine. I've got it up here on the board. So Eliphaz has a wife, Adah, and a wife, Timnah. Uh, the wife, Timnah, is actually a concubine. Adah has five sons. Boom, 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 boom. Adah has one son. I mean, Timnah has one son. Boom. We know about this Abimelech. We know about this Abimelech. Turn to your page. I want you to see this in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Abimelech and his descendants are no good people. They are evil. They treat their cousins, the Israelites that are coming out of Egypt, with disdain. And they treat them horribly. And in fact, they treat them so bad that the Lord gives Moses and Joshua instruction what to do when they've finally taken the promised land and what to do with the Malachites, the descendants of Amalek. It says, remember, that, remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out from Egypt? How he met you along the way and attacked among, uh, attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary, and he did not fear God. Therefore, it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you the rest, uh, given you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. Now, I've always wondered how if you blot out the memory from under heaven, how you're not for supposed to for forget to do it. That forget and blot it out so you're not supposed to remember it, but don't forget. It's a Hebrew way of saying, don't you forget what I tell you. You destroy them. You kill them all. And so Moses and Joshua are instructed to kill every one of these descendants. They're cousins, folks. Their cousins, but they treated them badly. Then he goes on to uh, sons of Ruel. Now these are the sons of Ruel: Nahath, Zerah, Shama, Mizah. These are the sons of Esau's wife, Basman. So you see over in the list here, I got Ruel, and we got some sons. Boom, 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 boom. These are grandsons. His sons are Eliphaz, Ruel, Jeshus. Uh, Jalam and Korah. Those are his sons, and these are his grandsons listed here. So we put those on the chart. 
I'm rushing through this because I know it's painful. Because <laughs> it's painful for me. And these are the sons of Esau's wife, Oli Obama, the daughter of Anna, the granddaughter of Zebian. She bore to Esau, Jeus, Jamla, and Korah. So here we go. Here they are. He's married her. And here's the three sons. Oh, wait a minute. Let's just find out where she fits. Seir, Seir, is the grandson of Canaan. So he's a Canaanite. He happens to be a Hittite, who happens to be a Horite, because that's the clan. And over here under Zibion, Zibion had two sons. And from this son came this daughter, Ohalabama, who gave these three sons. So that connects Esau directly into the Canaanite line. That's just one spot. We'll find another. So verse 15 says, these are the chiefs of the sons of Esau. Chiefs. What does he mean by chiefs? Well, these are the ones who are going to have the clans. And remember, Moses is writing when he's 82 years old. 400 and something years have passed since this all began. And these kiddos of, of Esau have had time to grow. And they have had time to mature and have families and all of that. And so these chiefs were the heads of the family. That's the heads of the tribes. Just like a chief, think about an Indian chief or whatever. These chiefs are heads of their tribes, and they're living in different places. Chief Eliphaz had, the, I mean, Eliphaz had these as his chiefs. Teman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz, Chief Korah, Gatam, and Amalek. Look here. Teman, Omar, Zephar, Gatam, Kenaz, and Amalek. These were the chiefs of the tribes. Well, wait a minute. Time out. I remember, because I've read this before, and I wrote the lesson, they included Korah there. But Korah is not his son. Korah belongs to Ohalabama. How did that happen? The answer to that question is very easy. When we go to the Samaritan version, which is a Samaritan a speaking uh written language of which the Hebrew was translated into, it has Korah in the right place. Korah is not here. Also, when we go to the Septuagint, the Greek translation, it is not there. What does that mean? That means somewhere along the line, as we're making copies for people of the Old Testament Scripture, some well-meaning editor accidentally brought Korah's name up here, but the same matching uh, translations that are older into other languages do not have this mistake. It's a copy error. Okay, got it? By the way, it's kind of interesting. Some of you say, some have said, and you hear an argument, for, an argument for not believing the Bible, that you can't believe the Bible because there's been too many changes in the Bible. Because when we look at the original autographs, which by the way is redundant, you should say when you look at the originals, or when you look at the autographs, because autographs always mean the originals, okay? We don't have any of those. We don't have any of those. Uh, so, because we don't have any of those, we're relying on the copies that have been made. Okay. You say, well, we can't trust copies that have been made. How many of y'all have gone to your pharmacist and gotten a prescription this week. Good. And they printed out something for you to read. Got it? Right? You printed out something for you to read. How can you trust what they printed out for you to read? Because that's not the original. That's a copy of the original. Did you catch it? That's a copy. How do you know in the transmitting of the ones and zeros and the dots and all that kind of stuff that some glitch didn't come in to cause a problem along the way? You cannot go grab a bottle of, of uh, shampoo that has the instructions that say, wet hair, apply, lather, rinse, and repeat. Because that message that is on there is not the original. Somebody wrote the original someplace else and they copied it onto the label. How can you be sure the label is correct? Now, if you're going to use 
that argument against the Bible, we got another problem. The other deal is, we have so many copies of this stuff in so many languages that we do not have to worry about the veracity of the truthfulness of it because we've got too many that are too close to when it's being written. People go, oh, we, we can't. We can't trust the book of Mark because it's made out of copies. And I'll go, okay, so because we have a full, we have uh, many copies of the full book of Mark that was, was copied within a hundred years of the original. You can't trust that? Okay, you can't trust that. All right. So how many you trust Homer? When you read Homer's The Iliad or The Odyssey, uh, how many of you trust those? Because the nearest copies we have of those to the original are more than 700 years old. And besides that, we only have one third of the Iliad and The Odyssey. And the other two thirds of each of those are made up by people because we don't have them because they were destroyed. We don't know two thirds of either of those books. The story has just been told. So how do we know? Well, how do we know? I would rather trust something that we've got a lot more closer to it. And so here we've got others that are closer. We've got a Samaritan copy that is made within just a few years after they have come back and in, come into the promised land. And then we've got a Septuagint, that, uh, a Greek copy that is uh, of it, a translation is going to be made. And if those don't have it in it, then the original Hebrew probably did not have it in it. It's been a copy error. It just so happens that some of the copies we're using has that trouble in it. I hope that's a good explanation for you. So if anybody says, I can't trust the Bible, say, why not? Because it's not the originals. Do you have any originals? If you did not write it, by the way, you probably do not have the original of anything. You don't even have the original lesson. right the original lesson is in handwriting in my desk oh I could bring it out and go ooh, oh, ooh, oh, it's the original you know no it's better typed believe me because sometimes I just scribble a line you know I do have a doctorate and it's a doctorate you have to scribble my beautiful handwriting went to mm, we well, start a J and pull a line and that's 15 letters in that line you know you just can't read it all right well, some of that I do because when I write the word Jesus, I go J and just a line because I know it's Jesus. It's shorthand for me, okay? Anybody else reading may not know that. Moses, M. I know to write Moses because it's shorthand. You don't have the original of my lesson. This is a copy of it. By the way, it does have some mistakes in it too. <laughs> but, my original, but my original had more mistakes in it here. Here we go. Okay, so... Here at the beginning, when these sons get their, their, get their families going, they, the head of each tribe is called a chief. So this is at the very beginning. The chief of this group and the chiefs of that group, chief of this group. These are the chiefs. Looking on, it says, and these are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, and names the chief. Chief this one, chief this one, chief this one, and chief different. I don't have to read it to you because I just told you what happened. And so then we see in verse 18, and three chiefs from Ohalabama. It says, and these are the sons of Esau's wife, Ohalabama, chief Jeus, chief Jalam, and chief Korah. And it goes on to tell us these are who the, the sons are. Okay, now I got a question. How did these three guys get to be chiefs and these two guys did not get to be chiefs? Did you notice? It's grandsons that are chiefs here, but evidently their families are just probably starting and they're growing their clans, which they're going to have some sons. But when it started out, when the chiefs were actually put in place and actually named, these three sons probably did not have an old enough grandsons to be called chiefs. So they're added to it. So what do we have? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 chiefs that are the chiefs of the clans of Esau's descendants. At the very beginning, at the very beginning, page turn, verse 20, 
Now these are the sons of Seir the Horite. Horite means cave dwellers. The inhabitants of the land. Time out. Instead of reading all this, come to the board with me. Makes it much easier. Here are the sons and one daughter of Seir. This is what's in the text. Just let me lay it out for you. There was Lotan, Shobal, Zebion, Anna, Dishon, Ezer, Dishan, and a girl named Timna. Got it? Now, in that paragraph, it tells us that Lotran had two sons. Shobal had five sons. Names them for us. Zibion had two, and one of them named Anna, not this Anna, but this Anna, had a daughter named Olabama who had three sons. Look at who that connects to. He mar she married Esau. Got that? Nice and easy. Then we have Deshaun with four, Ezar with three, Deshan with two. And by the way, we're interesting because we've got the name Uz here. This name Uz is important because we're going to see that name Uz in the book of Job. And then we have Timna, and Timna has married and is the concubine. She has Amalek, and the scripture right there tells us that she has Amalek, which means this Tima and Amalek is this Tima and Amalek. And so Esau has actually married into the family of Seir with, one of, with his daughter and with a granddaughter. And with that, with that, uh, let's go on to the next. Then he comes along and he says, so these are the chiefs, uh, verse 29, of the descendants of the Horites. And they're the list of the ones that are right here on top. Chief Lotram, Chief Shobal, Chief Zebion, Anna, Dishon, Elazar, and Dishan. Timna is not a chief because she's a girl. I guess girls can't be chiefs. They have to be chiefettes. And that's not part of what was okay back then. Now look here in verse 31. It says, now Moses is tying up loose ends here. He's tying up loose ends. And he's summarizing all the relationships of Esau. And I am going to read this one to you because it's important. Verse 36, 31 says, Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. Okay, that causes me to pause and ask a question. How did they know there were going to be kings that were going to reign over Israel? Hmm. We'll answer that one in a little bit. Here we go. Belez, the first king, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom. And the name of his city was Dinaba. And Bela died. And Jobab, the son of Zerah, of uh, Basra, became the king in his place. Jobab. J-O-B-A-D. Wonder if that might be a long name for a man in another book of our Bible by the name of J-O-B. Job, and here his name is Jobab. Is there reasons why? Yeah, yeah, pretty good reasons. One of his friends that came to visit him might be Eliphaz. Do we have an Eliphaz? Yeah, I think we do. Right age, right time. Uh, we need sons of us and sons of Buzz. Well, Buzz is a son of um, Abraham. And we need some Temanites, a Temanite to come along. And lo and behold, we have a Teman, who, by the way, Teman is going to be very important to us because in on the last day that the Lord comes to Armageddon, he is going to make a stop at the chief city of the tribe of Teman to destroy that city before he moves on to the valley of Armageddon. It all ties together. Here it is in the beginning of the book, and you're going to see it at the end of the book. Not the book of Genesis. I'm talking about the book. 
By the way, you know the word Bible means the book. We just put the word Bible on there so that we would know what we were talking about because we didn't want you to think we were talking about the book, like a book you bought in the library over there about somebody wrote about, you know, planting strawberries in the middle of February. We're talking about it's probably a copy, which it is a copy, yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, they don't show that's exactly that's exactly that's what they do. That's right. They sure do. By the way, we might just have to talk about that. You know, we're an illiterate society today. We learn all of our information from video and TV. We don't learn it from reading anymore. Very few people. Now, some of y'all are not illiterate. I'm not saying that. I mean, you can read, but you don't enjoy reading, you know. Some of y'all in here, I give you every book I got, and you haven't read in a day and a half. That tells you how deep it is. But anyway, it goes on. It says, verse 35, Then Husham died. I'm sorry. Then Jobab died, and Husham uh, of the land of the Temanites, see we got Temans up here, Temanites, became king in his place. And Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in the field of Moab, became the king in his place, and the name of his city was Avet, Avith. And then Hadad died, and Shemel of Mazarkah uh, became king in his place. And Shemal died, you notice that Guys are dying, and somebody's taking their place. And Shual, or Saul, uh, of Rehoboth, of the, uh, of the river, became king in his place. Then Shual died, and Baal Hanam, the son of Achbor, became king in his place. And this is boring, but we're going to get through it because it's an important point here. And then Baal Hanam, the son of Achbor, died. And Hadar king, became king in his place. Don't fall asleep yet. And the name of his city was Pa. And his wife's name was Mehatabel, and the daughter of Matrid, and the daughter of Mezahab. Okay. Now, it's very interesting that we read that, and I read that to you on purpose, because I wanted to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 43 through 50. Okay. It says, Now there are, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king of the sons of Israel reigned. Bela was the son of Behar. The name of his city was Dinabah. You notice it's exactly the same thing? And in the Hebrew, it's exactly word for word. So I have to ask the question, since I'm asking questions. Did Moses write this and put this here in Genesis, and then the, chron the author of the Chronicles take it, borrow it, and put it over in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 1, or was it written over in 1 Chronicles chapter 1 and some well-meaning a copy person went and got it and put it in here, in Moses. Then Moses didn't write it. Well, that's a pretty good question. Okay, well, before we answer that question, let's look at this. Go on to the next page. I want to show you the chart. Yes. No, 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 no. Totally different people. In fact, look on your next page because we're going to list the kings. The chiefs were the heads of the tribes, but over all the tribes they had a king. And Moses is telling us here, the first king was Bela, the son of Beor. It's on page 260 on the chart. Page 260. Are you there? Look on the next. Got 260 on the chart. Bela was the first. Jobad, Husham. Here's the list. And what city they're reigning in and who their wives are if we know. There's an interesting thing here. I know Moses is 400 plus years after this, but why is he telling us this lineage of kings? And by the way, it uses the word melech, the Hebrew word melech, so it means kings. These are not chiefs. These are not lords. These are not mayors. These are kings over all the tribes of the Edomites. That's what it means. Moses is telling us this all the way down. And one follows the other. Because remember, the, the one before died before the next one took over. Now, we cannot, because we do not have the information for this, we cannot place them in line and say, he reigned this long, and he was at this city, and he, the next one came on and reigned this long, and here's the timeline. Moses did not give us that information. But let me tell you what I believe Moses did. 
I believe that Moses, because this is a summary of everything, because especially what's fixing to come, Moses is telling us all the kings in order. And he knows all those kings in order because of a certain reason. And he's telling us that because I believe that the last king's king of the Edomites that was in power at the time Moses was writing the book of Genesis is Hadar, the very last king. He's told us the lineage of the kings. And the one that is there when, he is, when Moses is 82 years old and writing the book of Genesis down, I believe he's telling us who that king was that was in power when they're fixing to go into the promised land 38 years from now. This king's in power. Now there was an interesting line in this whole thing. In verse 35, and you don't have to turn backwards, you can look on the bottom of page 260 at the bold print. In that whole thing I read with the kings, there's an interesting line. Verse 35 says, Then Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who defeated Midian in, the, Midian in the field of Moab, became king in his place. You don't see that about any other king, do you? There's no extracurricular information. This king lived, he was reigning, he lived in this town, he died. This king took over, he lived in this town, he died. And here we hear an interesting thing about this king, about this king who killed Midian. Who was Midian? Midian was the fourth son of Abraham by his wife Keturah. He took Keturah to be his wife after Sarah died. And Midian was the fourth son of Keturah. When Midian became, came of age where he should start a family, Abraham gave him a gift and sent him out towards the east to go build his family. In fact, Abraham did that with all of his sons, including Ishmael, that he had gotten rid of, gotten him out of the family when, um, when Isaac was just four years old. Ishmael was 14. Abraham gave him a gift with Hagar, sent them out and on their way. The rest of the sons are born with the Keturah. He gives them gifts, sends them out to the east when they become of age, so that when Abraham dies, Isaac inherits the entire wealth of Abraham. Midian was the fourth son. Now let me just remind you about Moses. Moses was born in Egypt, put in a basket. We're going to see that in the book of Exodus. He's raised in Pharaoh's house until he becomes the age of 40. And at the age of 40, he is run out of Egypt and he lands in the land of Midian. And he marries the daughter of a Midianite priest. And he marries into the Midianite clan. And he is part of the Midianite clan for 40 years. Remember that? When he goes up on the mountain and sees the burning bush, it is on a mountain in the land of Midian. Mount Sinai in the land of Midian. Midian is next door neighbors to the Edomites. And they were bitter enemies because one of the Edomite kings killed their patriarch, Midian. Moses had first-hand knowledge of the history and the genealogy of not only the Midianites, but also the Edomites. Because for 40 years, from age 40 to age 80, he's living there. At age 80, he's called to go to Egypt. They go to Egypt. They go in there, they have the plagues, they come out, they end up back at the same mount again, that burning volcano mount. And in the second year that they are there, he pins the book of Genesis. And I believe that he he's telling us here that Hadar is the king who is in power while we're here writing this book of Genesis. If it wasn't, he would tell us the rest of who the kings were. That's my opinion. I believe it will be right. Based on that, how do I think? Why do I think that's my opinion? Because of the next thing that, Esau, uh, that Moses says. 
Now, these are the names of the chiefs, descendants of Esau. I thought we already had the names of these chiefs, didn't we? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen chiefs. Well, let's see the list. It says, according to their families and according to the localities by their names, Chief Timna. Teman, Omar, Zephar, Gadam, Kenaz, Amalek, Naboth, Zerah, Shammah, Mezah. Where's Tim? Timna's a girl. Oh, wait a minute. That's a chief. Mm, by the way, it has masculine endings on the name instead of feminine endings on the name. So we're not, some guy was named that same name and has now become a chief of the Edomites. Chief, Timnah. Oh, I got him up here. We'll just read on over here. And then there's a chief, Alva. No Alva over here. And Jetheth. No Jepheth. And Olabama, we got that. Olabama, right that? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Olabama is a, a girl, but over here it's a male. Ella, Ella, Pinon, Kanaz, finally. We got one right there, right there, right there, right there. Got it, okay? Timna, right there. Mibzar, Magdil. Where'd all these guys come from? We can match up three of them. Here's what this is, folks. These were the chiefs at the beginning. But when Moses is writing the book of Genesis, 400 and something years later, these are the chiefs who are in power when he's writing down the book of Genesis. These were the kings who led up to the last king that was still in power whenever the book of Genesis was written. And here are the chiefs who are now in charge. These are the guys that whenever that, these are the heads of the tribes that whenever they're going to go into the promised land and they're going to cross the Edomite land, these are the men they're going to have to deal with. Whew, sure glad that's over with. These names become important to us because they tell us things later on. And Moses has been gracious enough. So what happens? From the beginning of the story of chapter 36 until the end, we're covering about 430 years or more, okay? But in next week's lesson, we have to back up because Moses is finished with Isaac, Moses is finished with Esau, and we've got to go back in the next week's lesson to Joseph who is going to be 17 years old because Joseph's not been sold into captivity yet. And that begins in next week's lesson. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your loving kindness to share the important things with us that we need to know. And while sometimes these um, are difficult to follow, we hope we've made them easy in some way so that we can use them as a resource to find out later on who you're speaking about when you're telling us a story. Lord, because that's what's important. In your name, amen and amen.